we are live a very good evening everyone welcome to i focus online lecture 232 uh, number 19 from our series on squint and pediatric ophthalmology today is a master class uh, by dr minakshi swaminathan from chennai uh, we are honored to have her for the second time this week and she's talking to us on exo deviations terminologies classification etiology symptoms signs diagnosis and treatment and case examples that is a part 2 of our master class Ma'am is a beloved teacher, and she knows uh, she needs no introduction. But I still invite Pradeep Sharma sir to uh, welcome her for the evening and uh, introduce her for our audiences. Thank you, Dr. Shifali. It's always a pleasure to welcome Dr. Minakshi, one of uh, my favorite uh, speakers in Stravismus. She gets so much involved in the uh, presentation that everybody gets involved. So that is what is uh, really. <laughs> very nice to hear from her she's always known for her interactive uh, master classes so this one uh, is again uh, part 2 and just in short about her uh, uh, cv uh, she's been done a residency from pgimr chandigarh and then university of louisville kentucky she did a fellowship in pediatric ophthalmology from university of iowa and then she came to india and that's as i said earlier that she has been again for india and lost to united states and she started working in shankar netrale chennai and currently now she is doing uh, her uh, stint in capstone clinic chennai part of teachers in ophthalmology programs in india and other countries in collaboration with ico she has been a part of the children's healthy eyes bring educational reward the cheer project a joint initiative between ico and orbis uh, china chapter in august 2014 she, she has numerous awards and accolades Stravismus keynote by WSPS 2021 visiting professorship at LVPI Bhuvaneshwar, Dr. S. S. Vadrinath Medal of Honor to uh, 2013, and Captain Subramaniam Best Video Film Award in TNOA 2006, and many many more. But the best part is her presentation, and we now uh, look forward to it. Dr. Minakshi, please. Thank you so much, Dr. Pradeep. Uh, I already feel a little shy that you had to introduce me again. Uh, <laughs> I'm also happy that uh, hello hello Santosh. Hi. Uh, I I'm also happy that this is um, we don't have the audience in front of me because uh, I would have to wake them all up uh, 8 p.m. and I'm so glad that this is being recorded so the audience can actually uh, the postgraduates can look at it at their leisure. So which is, which 900 is of them have seen your uh, last lecture. I mean actually oh, already. Wow. Okay. Yeah. Lovely. Uh, thank you. I got a couple of people who actually messaged me and said, uh, uh, "Ma'am, uh, as you you are as usual and all that." So anyway, thank you, Santosh, for this. I uh, this is something I miss because I moved to private practice and you've uh, really filled that uh, little void that I uh, have. So this is great. So without uh, further ado, I will uh, go on to part two. So we covered a lot of ground in part one, and so in part two. we are going to focus really on management okay that is going to be our our focus so let's start off and uh, recap the differential diagnosis i think that is the key that is um, so so essential uh, so let us start off do you remember this patient from last time i'm sure many of you do so this is patient number 1 uh let's say you can see that he does have a left exotropia and um, you, but the if you look more carefully the left eye looks smaller and um if you see you can see the abduction in the lower photograph is limited and uh, if you make him adduct adduct the eye you can see that is also limited and there is some globe retraction that is visible so it's quite uh, clear that this patient has exotropic uh, duanes uh, and uh, how do you somebody asked last time how do you uh, know uh, incompetent from uh, you know regular run of the mill intermittent exotropia and usually they have a face turn there is an eye size difference that is obvious there is definite duction limitation like you saw and often there may be coexisting anomalies such as upshoot downshoot narrowing of the palpable fissure globe retraction etc so watch out carefully for these um before you label it as uh, regular exotropia this is patient number 2 he um had 
uh, he was he was born uh, when he was born when he had a had um, some delayed milestones, delayed cry, and because of probably because of which he has optic atrophy in both eyes. And right eye vision is uh, six by sixty, left eye six by twelve. But he has got optic atrophy in the right eye and marked temporal pallor in the left eye. And uh, we're going to see him a little bit more later uh, in the talk. But you can clearly see there is a, a right exotropia. And when you look at his fundus, you can the optic atrophy is quite clear. So this would be classified as sensory exotropia. And how? what are your clues? Usually, there'll be a less vision in the affected eye. And uh, movements to take a fixation may be unsteady in that eye. And a thorough examination of the eye will usually give you the diagnosis of sensory exotropia. OK, here is patient number three. And this uh, gentleman is actually a dentist. And uh, he had a motor vehicle accident. I uh, had a head injury, was in a coma, and when he recovered, he was diplopic. And you can clearly see the exotropia. There is also a mild hypotropia and an accompanying ptosis. And so this is oculomotor nerve palsy. Sometimes you may have face turn present, um, especially many congenital oculomotor nerve palsies. Often there is ptosis. Pupil may be involved. Duction limitation is usually very clear. And clearly, this is an incompetent strabismus, which means you're, it measures differently in different gazes. And uh, there is also very often aberrant regeneration. Now, here's uh, patient number four. And uh, what patient number four has uh, is this is her first photograph. And you can see in the first photograph that is, she clearly has an infantile esotropia. Now, infantile esotropia was corrected uh, with surgery, and that is how she looked. And all was well, everybody was happy. And then years later, she comes back looking like this. And you can see very clearly that the eye has eyes have drifted out. And uh, I don't know if you can see here, you can even see where the, the, the original insertion often leaves a little scar there, which can be seen through the conjunctiva. So this patient is, would be appropriately labeled consecutive exotropia because there is history of previous eye surgery. And when you examine the patients carefully, you can see conjunctival scars. And um, there may be variable duction limitation if a slipped muscle is suspected. Sometimes you may also see widening of the palpebral fissure in the direction of gaze of the slipped muscle. So these give you a clue that this is consecutive exotropia. Now, patient number five, uh, as you can see, he's got a large exotropia uh, present pretty much from birth. And uh, he's got a small chin down posture and that's because of an A pattern. And this, uh, is typically present from birth, large angles. And there are also some reports of coexisting delayed visual maturation in these patients. So I am not talking about uh, other really other conditions which are very classic, but which also present with exotropia like congenital fibrosis, uh, certain types, etc. But this is something I want to watch out for. So this is a patient who was treated for convergence insufficiency, had a horrible time in school, et cetera, et cetera. And she, would, she just did not respond to any exercises. And then the mother one day emailed this photograph and said, off late, her eyes are looking like this. Aha, and that is clearly, as you know, a, problem, a myasthenia gravis because you can see the ptosis and you can see the exotropia. And so this is a very big, important mimicker something to always watch out for is myasthenia, ocular myasthenia gravis. Okay, so I think those differential diagnoses are absolutely important to know uh, and to check before you say, okay, this is intermittent exotropia or decompensated exotropia. Now I'm going to manage this patient, right? Okay. Now, so what first we always like to look at non-surgical management and in this comes first the refractive correction we kind of looked at it the other day so let's re revise that quickly so uncorrected myopia with poor accommodation what happens 
the exotropia tends to become more manifest. So how are you going to manage if you find myopia coexisting with exotropia is give the full myopic correction. And uh, I took this uh, photograph from uh, the internet because I didn't have one of my own, which showed correction with glasses, simple myopic uh, refractive error, and there is correction and uh, of, of the exotropia. Astigmatism, full astigmatic correction in children and in older children and adults, if they are being given glasses for the first time, uh, then maximum tolerated uh, correction. How about hypermetropia? Now, high hypermetropia, they cannot accommodate to clear the blur. So exodeviation may be manifest, but appropriate undercorrection may improve the control. Why? Because the retinal image becomes clearer. Moderate hypermetropia, giving glasses, takes away the accommodative effort. That's how they, the, the, moderate hypermetropia, they're accommodating. And once you give the glasses, the accommodative effort goes away, and then the exodeviation can become manifest. Regardless, if it's going to improve vision, it may help improve control. So you do uh, give hypermetropic glasses, but give them uh, carefully. For example, this uh, patient, as you can tell, hypermetropic glasses have made her strabismus a little bit worse. What about? occlusion okay and the occlusion was a, a, a kind of a hot hot topic uh, not too long ago when do you give occlusion if there is amblyopia there is no question you do give occlusion strabismic amblyopia due to exotropia is treated according to standard guidelines and these guidelines are taken from the amblyopia treatment studies and you all have access to them they're all free access some Clinicians also occlude the preferred or dominant eye. Why? Because they want free alternation of exotropia or e and equal vision, which is the end point, and then only the patient will be considered for surgery. Uh, but some patients continue to have fixation preference, and uh, that is often called a fixed pattern. So, alternate occlusion, uh, where you um, cover either eye, and this particular study covered uh, for three hours a day. They also included patients uh, who covered uh, only the uh, clinicians who advised only covering the dominant eye. But this is a very, very important study. This was a randomized trial comparing part-time patching with observation for children th three to 10 years old with intermittent exotropia. This was published in Ophthalmology in 2014. And if you look at what exactly they did, they took kids between three to less than 11 year old, and uh, they had certain criteria of who would be taken in for the study. They had to have a certain deviation. Then the participants were randomly uh, assigned to either observation or patching for three hours per day for five months. And they had a washout period as well. So after the Going through the results, the conclusion was deterioration of previously untreated childhood intermittent exotropia over a six month period is uncommon with or without patching treatment. Although there is a slight lower deterioration rate with patching, both management approaches were considered reasonable for the three to 10 year old age group. Verdict, so what do we do? Well, if there's a clearly preferred eye. I think it is worthwhile patching, uh, occluding the eye, or sometimes you do it to buy time because the child is not cooperative for vision uh, for measurements. The child is not fixating on the uh, six meter target, uh, or is just uh, you know difficult to examine or whatever. So sometimes you buy time uh, by advising alternate occlusion. So we move on to another non-surgical therapy, which is over minus lens therapy. Again, was in the news, again, a hot topic. How does it work? The lens stimulates accommodation, right? So the over minus lens stimulates accommodation. Accommodation leads to convergence and hence better control of intermittent exotropia. And that is how uh, over minus lens therapy works. So this is one of my patients, it's, I'll be honest with you, are very 
rarely use it. Uh, but this is one of my patients who did who had a small exotropia. Parents were not keen on surgery and overmyosin minus lens therapy for a period of about six months uh, helped keep alignment. So if you look at the history of over minus lens therapy, it has been around for a long, long time. So uh, typically how much has been given a, 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 as over minus lens therapy? About two to four diopters of over minus. What do you watch out for? You have to be very careful that the patient in their effort to accommodate and converge does not develop an esotropia. Patients who are also constantly made to accommodate can have asthenopia, diplopia, um, and can also have decreased distance vision. And all these warrant that you will have to uh, discontinue. And in, our, in, in the US and other Western countries, these children start school at five. Our uh, kids here in India often start school at three or even earlier. So, um, and they are very quickly moved to board copying, et cetera. It would be very difficult for them to first to keep them in the over minus therapy. Now we come to the really worrying thing. The greatest worry is by making this patient accommodate continuously. Are you inducing myopia or is the progression of myopia? So this is a great concern. So Kushner, uh, who we all look up to, Dr. Bert Kushner of University of Wisconsin, is a doyen in uh, the area of pediatric and strabismus. And um, uh, we constantly look uh, up to him for a lot of uh, guidance and very scientific approach. So according to Dr. Kushner, this publication way back uh, in 1999, where he looked at whether over minus therapy was leading to myopia, and he did not find uh, so, but later on in several discussions, we find that he does not use a lot of over minus. And also, he also you gives a small amount of basin prism in the spectacles, perhaps to reduce the convergence. Now, this was published last year in uh, JAMA and a very, very important uh, study. And this was conducted by the PEDIC group, the Pediatric Eye Disease Investigative Group. And they uh, looked at over minus lens therapy for the three to 10 year age group with intermittent exotropia. Now I'm just gonna jump to the findings. Now in the findings, they found that the, um, uh, it was significantly better that the children with over minus spectacles versus non over minus spectacles did show better control. But after weaning off the over minus spectacles, there was little or no difference uh, in the distance control. So basically they looked at distance control, and uh, but this was really the uh, worrying thing. Myopic shift was approximately one third diopter greater in the over minus than in the non over minus group. And so the safety monitoring committee actually um, asked the study to be terminated because that was considered an accept unacceptable, unacceptable um, progression in myopia. Now, in contrast to this, in 2022, just this very year, uh, in February, came this study from um, Australia, where they basically used a novel algorithm, and they used a customized um, over minus lens therapy, and they found that there was a slight increase in myopia progression, but not really significant. It was not statistically significant. Now, what do we do? Where do we, where do we go from here? Because there are so many contrasting views. So I would be in favor of using with caution. Be very clear in explaining to the parents that it may induce myopia or cause myopia to progress. And so it kind of makes sense. Maybe one should be avoiding this in myopes. Now, what about fusion exercises? Now, fusion exercises have had, um, you know, there's a lot of variability in literature. It seems to be something that is used a lot um, in uh, optometric literature where they have software-based uh, therapy these days. They used to have synoptophore-based therapy, et cetera, et cetera. But uh, fusion exercises, when uh, a lot of them work for near 
and near the patient or usually has very, very good control. And so the role of fusion exercises really in intermittent exotropia is not very clear. And uh, I would uh, love to hear Dr. Pradeep uh, Sharma's uh, comments when we finish the talk. What about prisms? There is always a worry that if you fit prisms in these patients with intermittent exotropia, that it will cause uh, you know, a worsening of the exotropia because they may eat up the prisms. But small angle exotropias with asthenopia uh, in patients may be uh, benefited by using a small prism in their glasses. Okay, so now we move on to really understanding what is the natural history of this disease? The parents are going to ask uh, when they come and they, you've made this diagnosis and they're going to say, you know, doctor, what, what's going to happen? Uh, is, is this going to keep getting worse? Is there any chance he or she will, or they will improve spontaneously? And so then uh, natural history from many other studies is you, has been thought of as obscure because uh, a very important observational study by Von Norden showed that 75% untreated patients showed progression over an average follow-up period of about three and a half years, and 9% worsened and 16% improved. And when you look at another study from by Hiles, it showed no significant change in the deviation after an average of 11 years follow-up, and only two patients progressed to a constant tropia. So you tell the parents that there is a high likelihood of progression. I think that seems to be a fair statement. Okay, so you have decided, you've tried um, conservative management, you've tried non-surgical therapies, and then so now you have to decide, yes, I think we are going to think about surgery. So a few things need to be considered before you make that decision. The first thing is when to operate. Again, wide variation in literature, but most people agree. <laughs> Poor control of intermittent exotropia, deterioration of control of intermittent exotropia, severe asthenopia, visual confusion, and diplopia. <coughs> Excuse me. And sometimes for cosmesis. So let's look at this patient. <coughs> Parents clearly say that they see worsening control. And you can see child when no confusion takes a while to be fixated. Okay. Ah, and she finally refixated. The refixation she brought her eyes together. So these are very important to document. So how do you define poor control? We talked a little bit about it last time. You basically measure near and distant stereopsis, but you also use a score. We talked about the Newcastle score, the revised Newcastle score. We also talked about the office control score used in the PEDIC studies. So you need to document home control, office control, at near and office control at distance. I mean, when I say office, I mean clinic, obviously. So, but motor control is the key. So if you want to look at it, I want to say it in a simple language. How easy is it to break fusion in the clinic? Slower recovery of the drift. In other words, how quickly the patient restores normal alignment after dissociation. You saw in this video, the child took a while to align the eyes. More frequent episodes of drift, usually this the parents will tell you. And a good history from the parents is what really clarifies everything, uh, what happens the rest of the time at home. Fine, so you've made this diagnosis, it's clear the control is deteriorating and you are now contemplating offering surgical correction. Early surgery or late surgery? When we mean early surgery, it's before four years of age. Better results for many studies. And, but there seems to be no relationship 
in some of the studies between age and success. What is the what are the risks? Reoperation, because uh, your measurements may not have been that accurate at six meters, may have missed an oblique overaction, underaction. Risk of amblyopia. And why is this? Because the loss of fusion is greater in the younger patients because they may be esotropic in the early uh, few days to weeks after surgery, which is an intentional sort of overcorrection, desirable, because that is a stimulus for fusion. We talked about it uh, briefly uh, last time. Dr. Pradeep Sharma was mentioning it. So, but what happens? We're going to talk about it a little bit later. So all these, the risk of losing fusion, risk of becoming amblyopic because of that, all this is other risks associated with early surgery. Later surgery, well, we did notice that a small percentage have spontaneous resolution and improvement, and it gives you a chance to observe closely for control and deterioration before you take the call for surgery. So when you put all the studies together and look, when what guaranteed or, or, or more favorable with best outcomes? When the patients were surgically aligned before seven years of age, when surgery was performed for strabismus, duration less than five years, when surgery was performed while the deviation was still intermittent rather than constant. Okay, so I think this gives you some idea about when to intervene. Okay, we are almost there and now we're getting ready for surgery. Now I'm going to present to you something we alluded to last time. And what is this? This is Kushner's new classification of intermittent exotropia. And later on, I will show you a table comparing Burian's classification and Kushner's. Now you may wonder why, why did we not talk about this even last time? Uh, we did, if you remember Dr. Uh, Pradeep Sharma talked a little bit about how the tenacious proximal fusion has been replaced by the term SCOBY phenomenon, um, which basically tells you that near angles or near control, near angle tends to be very, very small. And this is because of binasal uh, preponderance of binasal disparity in these patients. And this is called the SCOBY phenomenon. Okay, so based on the, and the reason we talked about Burian's, Burian's earlier is because that is a more traditional classification and that is perhaps something that is more widely known and it may be something that is maybe discussed if you are a postgraduate who's going to take an exam. But there is more and more thinking towards um, uh, Kushner's classification. And this is just a table that tells you what is the, prevalence. Okay, so the one with tenacious proximal fusion or what is called the SCOBY phenomenon seems to be the most common one with 40% of patients um, having this. And so what exactly do you see in that? Distance measurement initially exceeds the near, but the near measurement increases after 60 minutes of occlusion. Why are we not calling this divergence excess? If you see, if you go through the, go down the list, you can see Divergence excess has been replaced by proximal convergence because there really is no, divergence is not an active phenomenon and divergence, there's no divergence center in the brain. And so because of this, the whole classification changed. Similarly, convergence insufficiency was divided into fusional convergence insufficiency type and pseudo convergence insufficiency, again, based on occlusion, 60 minutes of occlusion. So uh, the reason I'm presenting this to you is because we need to see what is our checklist before we take a patient up for surgery. So the questions to ask, has there been adequate amblyopia therapy? Whether it is amblyopia treatment or alternate occlusion or occlusion of the dominant eye. Has appropriate refractive correction been given to see whether that will improve control and ensure that your measurements are taken only with the appropriate refractive correction in place. Have near and distance measurements been done? 
and have you measured after 60 minute occlusion? Done a 60 minute occlusion and re-measured the patient. Try and get an AC by A ratio measurement when possible. In a lot of children, it may not be possible, but when you're planning in a young adult, adults, it is still very possible because as you saw earlier, AC by A ratio uh, is one of the ways in which we um, segregate the types. <laughs> The next thing you want to see if there is any oblique overaction present because that needs to be tackled at the same time. The next thing we're going to look at is if there is any pattern. A or V patterns are well known to coexist with exotropia and those have to be tackled at um, the time of surgery. So you remember this gentleman whom I was telling you about who has, uh, who had a delayed cry at the time of birth, along with optic atrophy in the right eye and temporal pallor in the left eye. And he we diagnosed to have sensory exotropia. And if you look at him, you can see that the, and we, do you want to call it oblique overaction, inferior oblique overaction, or do you want to call it hyper elevation in adduction, which is again, another terminology that is becoming more and more prevalent. Uh, so if you look at it, you can clearly see from this uh, central photograph, when he when there is levoversion, you can see the right eye is hyper elevating. Now, to be fair, if you look at it carefully, the fixing eye is the left eye because it has better vision. He has only 636 vision in the right eye and 612 in the left. He fix, when he fixes with the left eye, you can see that the right eye is not only exotropic, but also a bit hypotropic. And that is because if you go up to this picture, that is where the left eye, when you're looking at dextro elevation, you can see the left eye also shows the presence of inferior oblique overaction uh, or hyper elevation. So and when he fixes with this eye, corresponding hypotropia happens in the right eye. Okay, so the reason I shared this is because this patient recently underwent surgery and we did, I did not, I chose not to operate on the left eye because it was his better seeing eye and the patient also was reluctant for surgery in the left eye. And so we did tackle the inferior oblique in the right eye along with um, a recess resect procedure. Okay, so here is another girl. Um, she had... 45 prisms of exotropia basin, both for distance and for near. And uh, so there was no distance near disparity. So she was, uh, we labeled her as basic type and uh, did surgery in the left eye, which was her mostly deviating eye. And uh, she did well after surgery. Now, I want to point out to you that you do notice that there is a slight difference in the palpable fissure height which uh, can occur with large recess, resect, large resections particularly. And this is something uh, you want to explain to the uh, patient and or the parent if you're going to do monocular surgery. Right, so this patient uh, is what we used to call drivers and sexes, but now you call it proximal convergence. And this patient um, had a, uh, much larger deviation at distance and a small deviation of 10 prism XT at near. And he did not build with 45 minute, uh, with one hour, 60 minute occlusion as well. And so he chose to have bilateral surgery and um, it was fairly well aligned. Now we talked about patterns strabismus. Now here's a child with a large angle exotropia, no distance near disparity. Now, when you look at his ocular motility, you can see that there is some inferior oblique overaction or hyper elevation in adduction seen in both eyes, more in the right eye than the left eye. So this is something you would note and you would um, plan for the correcting the V pattern along with correcting the exotropia. If there was no oblique overaction as the cause of the V pattern, then you would transpose the recti. 
And that again is a different topic. Pattern strabismus management is a, a completely different topic. So this patient underwent bilateral inferior oblique weakening and bilateral lateral rectus recession. And you can see there is still a small residual inferior oblique uh, overaction here. The pattern is well, the V pattern is well collapsed. And here is the uh, aligned, fairly well aligned. In the left eye, the inferior oblique uh, overaction is well taken care of. <clears throat> now, we come to another very important um, uh, topic or, or, or conundrum uh, for every strabismus surgeon who takes care of um, exotropia, especially in younger children. Where do you leave the patient in the early postoperative? In fact, this is a conundrum for every strabismic patient. Every strabismic patient, you have to decide whether you want to do only for the right amount of uh, deviation. Do you want to slightly aim at overcorrection? Do you want to aim at undercorrection? Do you want to do an adjustable uh, strabismus surgery? This is a very important decision to make uh, with very important long, short term and long term consequences. So, if you look at this uh, kid, this is a child with congenital exotropia, if you recall. Um, I did not plan a large initial overcorrection. Um, this patient had an A pattern exotropia, so he underwent a bilateral posterior tenectomy, seven eighth tenectomy of the superior oblique and also underwent bilateral lateral rectus recession. Now, however, the patient did have an unintended, slightly larger esotropia in the early postoperative period, which uh, gave uh, a lot of um, anxiety for both myself, the surgeon, and for the, the parents. However, this patient was again treated with part-time patching to ensure that he does not start losing fusion and become amblyopic in the right eye. And you can see he's eventually, he's still not completely healed. This was a, a three week out photograph, but you can see the eye is almost straighter. It is straightening out really nicely. I have not yet seen the patient at final visit, but this, these, these are very crucial things um, to pay attention to. As we've talked about last time, again, why do you want to do this? Why do you desire a small, isotropic uh, correction, isotropic overcorrection early on, because that takes the patient out of the large scotoma, makes the, by inducing diplopia, and this diplopia awareness hopefully is the stimulus for fusion, and this is the thinking uh, behind uh, this kind of planning. So I'm going to just uh, share this photograph. I'm sorry for the quality. I took it from the book, as you can tell. And this is just comparing Burian's classification with Kushner's classification. And this is a very busy uh, sort of slide, but it gives you the rationale behind why the uh, classification has been re has renamed many of the original descriptions by Burian uh, and what tests to do for those and what appropriate surgery needs to be done depending on the diagnosis. Uh, very useful uh, reference, and I encourage you to look at it uh, at your leisure. Uh, it's beyond the scope of this talk to go over this in greater detail. Um, I'm just gonna leave you with a simple video of a lateral rectus recession. Um, and I think this is the last bit. And so this is a limbal incision sometimes preferred in the older patient because the phonics incision uh, can tear, the, the conjunctiva can tear easily. Um, like it's likely to be fragile in the older patients. And so a, a hook has been placed, replaced by Jameson hook and 6O vicral sutures, double arm sutures are taken with a partial thickness and then a full thickness bite and then um, the muscle is disinserted and the muscle is being now sutured back to the original insertion um, because this is, I believe, an adjustable in an older patient. And so it's being measured and appropriate corrections are being made. A bow tie is being placed. There are many, many ways of doing um, adjustable. This was a, a a long time ago, and this was um, a bow tie technique. 
and the conjunctiva is closed with the uh, atrial microbial sutures. The uh, adjustable sutures are all tucked in away from the cornea, and the patient will be um, you know, adjusted when, once recovered from anesthesia. So um, with that, I thank you so much for um, this opportunity to speak to the uh, postgraduates um, in a topic, in a subject that is very dear to me. And that is something that is constantly evolving, uh, growing and changing. And thank you so much, uh, Santosh, uh, for this invitation. And uh, we'll wait for questions. Um, thank you so much, ma'am. Thank you so much for that uh, very, very interesting and crisp lecture. Uh, sir, any uh, remarks from you? Or should we directly go to the questions? I think it was a very illustrative talk. And uh, ma'am has tried to uh, complete what uh, was initial part in the first part she had talked about the examination techniques here she has tried to explain with the case examples how to uh, do that differential diagnosis or investigation and finally the proper management and uh, i think it's a very nice elaborate talk on the types of exo deviations the intermittent exo deviations and the kushner's explanations for the uh, original classification of burian he has tried to subdivide the various categories and give more of a reason behind it. Uh, I personally don't want to change the names of the conditions. I would still call them by the uh, older names, but yeah, it helps us in understanding what is the underlying cause of these uh, different subdivisions. Uh, so I think we can have the questions. Uh, so today we have Dr. Abhishek Katyar, uh, who is here on the platform with us. Uh, he's a senior yeah. resident in ophthalmology. Uh, welcome Dr. Abhishek. Uh, he has posted a question, uh, so I'll just read it out. Uh, please explain the plus three diopter lens test that you had told in the previous lecture for AC by A ratio. So I, I would like to think of this test as something um, quick and easy to do in the, bed, in the cl clinic because uh, if you, I mean, detailed measurements of the uh, uh, high AC by A ratio in a child may not be possible. So if you just want to get some idea of whether a high AC by ratio is in the play to explain why the near angles are smaller uh, considerably and uh, than the distance angle, especially if the patient is not billed at all after a 60 minute occlusion, um, it just gives you a clue that high AC by ratio may be at play. And why that is important the plus three diopter lens or why discovering that uh, this is important is sometimes you may have a post-operative overcorrection, especially if the patient's angle has been extremely small at near, then you may have a post-operative overcorrection at near. Uh, you may want to uh, counsel the patient about possibility of needing bifocals. Sometimes you may have to, just one patient I did, a, I've had, I had to do, medial rectus fadden because the patient was very adamant about not wearing spectacles. Uh, and this patient clearly had a high AC by ratio type of uh, intermittent exotropia. And so I don't know if that answered your question, but that's just a quick test that you can do at the bedside. Uh, Dr. Pradeep, do, do you like to add to that? No, that's right. I think basically we are interested in knowing the underlying cause why there is a divergence excess. So uh, if there is a high AC by ratio, it explains that it may be one of the causes. And as I think ma'am had explained, and even Dr. Kushner has very importantly highlighted that you should always do this plus three test after doing the patch test. So it's very important. If you directly do a plus three test, you may uh, wrongly classify it and miss the SCOBIS phenomenon because there's no other way to differentiate. So always do a patch test, see that it's negative. Then only a high AC by ratio diagnosis should be made after doing a plus three. So this is something which one should keep in mind. Uh, so if there is a high AC by ratio, you know that either you will have to give bifocals or as ma'am said, you may do a Farden on the middle rectus to restrict that problem because it will give an overcorrection for near after the surgery. Uh, Dr. Abhishek, uh, you're here. I hope that answered your question. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Yes, ma'am, but uh, I'd only uh, to know that uh, how is it done in uh, in PD? Uh, your voice is breaking a little bit. 
मैम आई जस्ट वॉन्ट टू आस्ट टू डू दिस इन ओपीडी वट आर द इंटरप्रिटेशन how to do the test in opd ma'am and oh, what are the interpretation yeah. well um, you basically um, first do the occlusion first you take a near measurement distance measurement and then you put on a, a patch on the patient for 60 minutes and then without allowing the patient to fuse you remeasure for near and what you want to see at this point is whether the patient has built up the near angle to almost within 10 prism diopters of the distance angle now once you have that way you've ruled out the scobie's phenomenon now if the patient is not built up and then but you do know the near angle is still very small considerably small uh, in comparison to the distance angle then you just pick up the plus 3 lenses from your trial set and just hold them and you can pre measure or you can put them in a trial frame and actually re measure with the prisms in front i usually just have somebody hold them in front and then put the prism and measure and you want to see whether now the patient's angle builds up to close to the distance angle that's how we do it in the opd thank you ma'am uh any other question from you dr abhishek or i'll just move on to the other portal questions no ma'am i just want to put i just wanted to ask this only all all right uh, so the next question is uh, can you please explain the concept of over minus uh, glass prescription in myops with exotropia uh, do not prescribe over minus therapy in myops with exotropia and uh, that would be my take home message because recently um i am sure dr pradeep has seen the exchange of uh, a flurry of emails email exchanges amongst many clinicians who have used over minus therapy in the past especially after the publication uh, that came earlier this year from uh, australia saying that there was no increase in uh, uh, myopia progression so after that the consensus seems to be especially with the pedic study clearly showing that there was increase in myopia Uh, progression with over minus therapy i don't think any myop should definitely be put in over minus lens therapy uh, that would be my take on it whether emetropes can be given i still tend to towards giving emetropes but not those who have a strong family history or um, who already are myopic i don't know if it's a good idea to give i wouldn't what about you dr pradeep yeah so what i do is that first of all i see that there has to be a high ac by ratio if there is no high ac by ratio over minus therapy is not the thing to be done then they cannot tolerate that a normal person with a normal 3 to 5 prism diopter per uh, diopter uh, ac by ratio is not the candidate for a over minus therapy it has to be one who has 5 to 8 prism diopters per diopter of accommodation then only we think of doing an over minus therapy secondly this over minus therapy is a short term measure to defer a surgery for whatever reasons you have that you are, you are not able to operate then you can give a over minus therapy if there is a high ac by ratio so both the things should be there it's a short term thing it's only for people who have a high ac by ratio because you have to understand that how much can you give if you give let's say a two diopter or a four diopter also maximum of a my, over minus and with a normal of 3.5 prism diopter let's say or a four prism diopter the maximum effect will be 16 so that doesn't work so you have an exotropia usually of more than 16 prisms so that doesn't work unless there is a high ac by ratio in those cases suppose there is a high ac by ratio of 8 prism diopters then 8 into 4 is 32 and that really can be of some use so you need to see which candidate you are uh, seeing and if he is having a high ac by ratio then you can give this but yeah understand that this is not to be done for long it can induce myopia and otherwise also it will cause asthenopia accommodative convergence being used for correcting an exotropia is uh, not a good idea it is only meant to be for near and for distance if a child is using uh, even though he has an exuberant accommodation in the initial period so uh, i mean gradually he will wear off of this and then he will have eye strain so one should uh, desist from using it for long term yeah 
the next question is role of botox in intermittent exotropia any role of botox in intermittent exotropia i think i have seen some anecdotal papers um, you know claiming uh, case reports kind of but i the current literature or the consensus i don't think there is any role for a, a botox in intermittent xt uh, what what is your uh, opinion yeah i uh, have never been a very uh, keen proponent of uh, botox either for infantile exotropia or exotropia uh, dr uh, keith mcnear uh i happen to be uh, working with him in 2001 for two months and he has been he was i mean is no more now but he was the proponent of using it and he has published papers on both uh, for the exotropias as well as for infant infantile exotropias and uh, but the papers also show that there is almost like 3 to 3.5 or 3 to 4 times that you have to reinject so there is a recurrence in these cases mostly so even though in infantile esotropia or early muscles are supposed to be uh, different than the adult muscles they say that it modulates so if you inject botox in a medial rectus in a, a infant then the effect is supposed to be some uh, modulation of the muscle itself and it's supposed to be more lasting but still even in those publications you can see that they had to reinject so i wouldn't be very happy uh, in getting my child uh, again and again anesthetized for surgery uh, or botox both require anesthesia and whereas the surgery would give a much much uh, predictable result almost like 80 to 90% cases we get aligned in one surgery and only about 10% cases we may have to redo so i always prefer a surgery instead of botox either for esotropia or for exotropia right um another one is uh, when prisms are prescribed do we aim to neutralize the deviation or uh, reduce the deviation like fully neutralize it again uh, i am not a big uh, fan of uh, prescribing prisms for exotropia uh, because uh, again it's a very temporary measure uh, only time uh, i've used it is to alleviate symptoms of asthenopia in very small angle Uh, exotropes for variable control, uh, and uh, uh, sometimes very rarely in postoperative if they have an undercorrection to bring them in the fusional range. But otherwise, uh, it's a very temporary measure, and uh, because large amounts of prisms, uh, the, the 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 belief is that the patient will require more and more prisms, will sort of eat up the prisms. and um, so that is one big disadvantage and second is there is a limit to how much prism you can give in spectacles and third um, I, i mean you would not want to give a frenal prism as a, a long term solution for uh, anyone so i don't think uh, prism is really the way to go so your take anything i agree i mean prisms as an exercise measure is fine but for giving them as a therapeutic thing especially for exotropia is not something that we usually recommend for esotropia as yes if there is a consecutive eso in an ids then maybe you can give prism because uh, otherwise that eso will cause a uh, problem till the time you are waiting for surgery or you want that to reduce in uh, a month or two months time then prisms can be given for a consecutive eso that means it's a, a base out prism but a base in prism to correct an exotropia is really uh, not a desirable thing you may give exercises for a residual exo which is there that may be better off the fusional uh, convergence can be built up and that may help the residual exos instead of prisms okay uh, the next one is does determination of near stereo acuity uh, is it important in management of intermittent exotropia near stereo acuity uh, unfortunately uh, tends to remain fairly good um even when uh, distance control is not great uh, but I, i think the contrary is important if near acuity near stereopsis is is bad or is not is not very good then there is the, that's i think especially for reliable test then i think that goes more in favor of uh, control being quite uh, poor and perhaps a, a clear indication for surgery um 
Dr. Yeah, I always believe that stereopsis is an objective measure. So sometimes the control uh, is something which is not uh, uh, definitely established by the mother who is uh, working. More and more uh, mothers are now working and they say that we don't have that much time to observe that we can say that yes, he has 50% control or uh, more than 50%. So in that case, yes, if you can do uh, uh, stereopsis testing, uh, then it helps. And I agree that distance stereopsis is definitely an earlier indicator, but most people will not have in clinical practice a way to measure the distance stereopsis. So the near stereopsis is uh, another way of assessing it. But it always means that if the near stereopsis is affected, it is time for surgery. Uh, the other thing that you use it is prognosticating after the surgery and whether there is an improvement uh, in the case or not, or you have restored the stereopsis or not. Sometimes after the surgery, if you're losing for whatever reason, maybe it's a uh, ESO that you have given up or it's a residual EXO also, which is not fusing, then uh, the near stereopsis should be done. So I always keep on saying the stereopsis is one test which you should do in each and every child uh, whenever you are assessing the binocular vision and ocular mobility. Uh, the next one is, can you please explain about dissociated horizontal deviation? Um, am I allowed to say this is off topic? But anyway, so because uh, I, I, I'm sure dissociated strabismus complex would probably be another lecture in itself eventually. But dissociated horizontal deviation is akin to dissociated vertical deviation, except that it is horizontal. So it can sometimes mimic exotropia, and, uh, but often it's a monocular phenomenon because it can exist in both eyes, but it's a monocular phenomenon. It has a characteristics of the uh, DVD as in, ter in terms of speed, etc. The only time you, uh, I have uh, been able to diagnose this is when there seems to be a difference in the end point on your cover test, when your alternate cover test. You find one eye has completely stopped moving and the other eye is still doing a slow drift. And then that is when you make a diagnosis of DHD, but it is an important uh, differential in any patient with exotropia. Uh, so the last one to wrap up the day, I think it's a little practice question. How do we counsel parents of a child who might possibly need a second surgical correction? Any tips for counseling parents for a second surgical correction? So, uh, it all depends on whether you are you were the first surgeon also, or you are uh, seeing somebody else's uh, say residual exotropia or a consecutive exotropia. Uh, uh, it really depends on that. I think any strabismus surgeon will agree that all first surgeries should be, uh, as part of counseling for first surgeries, should be uh, made absolutely necessary that you should automatically counsel that that may need a second surgery. Uh, and this is, even though in private practice, it's a bit, bit hesitant, mm -hmm. hesitant to tell them, uh, I'm going to do the surgery, everything's going to be great, but there is a chance that you will need a second surgery. That is not a very good selling point uh, uh, for your, uh, you know, it's not, it doesn't look very good uh, for your, for your image. But the truth is, in strabismus, uh, I again, co as I quoted Dr. Uh, uh, William Scott, who was my mentor, he says, if your strabismus surgeon is doing, if your strabismus patient is doing well, it means either you have not measured them carefully or you have not seen them long enough. So that just tells you that um, a second surgery is always, always a possibility. And so in, in the first surgery itself, you need to um, make that uh, clear. But answering your question or the audience question of how do you counsel for a second surgery, I think it's important for the parent to understand uh, that the goal of surgery, which has not been attained. And what is the goal of surgery? Goal of surgery is either, a, a, you know, it, it could be that you are going to give a chance at fusion and or a high grade of stereopsis. And if so, that has not been achieved, and if you, uh, then it is time to consider a second surgery, number one. Number two, if the aim of sur initial surgery was also perhaps to say, correct an abnormal head posture, 
And uh, for example, a small uh, example of say, maybe a patient has an A pattern and the patient is also a glasses wearer, the child. And it has been inadequately corrected or maybe missed outside. And the patient continues to keep a chin down and is looking over the glasses, right? So the patient functionally is suboptimal and the abnormal head posture has not been corrected. So I think if you are clear in why a second surgery needs to be done and the goals of the second surgery, I think it would be uh, not be too hard to convince the parent. Dr. Pradeep, would you like to add? You have many, many years of surgical experience. Yeah, I mean, in this case, as uh, Dr. Minakshi has very nicely said, you need to impress upon what was the basic objective of surgery. We are doing surgery for the reason that we want an alignment. It's not that a partial uh, alignment is good enough. I generally say that uh, to other ophthalmologists also who do uh, strabismus surgery on the uh, sometimes that they, oh I got partial corrected. I said, would you do a cataract surgery in which you have a partial cataract left? No, you won't be happy. You wouldn't be. So why do you leave a partial strabismus left? How can that be considered as a success? So when I talk to these patients who have a re-surgery to be done, I tell them that, look, you have this problem. Your stereopsis is still getting compromised. And for this, it's important to show the stereo testing to the parents. I usually uh, put them on the TNO test and say that, look, do you have stereopsis C? Uh, and they understand, okay, this is 3D vision and my child is not having it. And this is the goal that we are looking forward to it. So then they can be easily convinced that this is something that we are aiming for. The people who have poor vision and only a sensory exotropia is being done, in those, of course, it's much easier for uh, the parents to understand that there is a cosmetic problem which is still there. So they would easily agree. The problem is when they do not know about stereopsis, you want to show them. So it's better to uh, check the stereopsis of the parent herself or himself and see that, yes, then they will really understand that, look, this is what I can see. Oh, this is so different. Many people actually don't even know about the 3D tests. Many a time they'll ask that, uh, are you doing a, a red, green uh, color vision testing? So I said, no, it's not for color vision, but it's for stereopsis. And just check for yourself will you know. And actually it's such a, uh, I mean, pleasant thing to see 3D yourself that everybody will be uh, understanding the importance of it. Yes. Thank you so much, uh, ma'am, for your very, very valuable time. Uh, not just one, but two classes this week. So we were like really lucky to have that. And Pradeep Sharma, sir, for your valuable inputs week after week. You truly are the cherry on the cake, as sir put it last time. Uh, the next lecture is going to be on 31st of August, uh, which is Cyclo-Vertical Deviations by Dr. Sujata Guha. Uh, so any concluding remarks from Thank you? Ali, I think again, once you have been moderating is so nicely so it's a blessing to this uh, program so i think thank you dr minakshi for that thank you. wonderful master classes on exotopias thank you and thank you Shafali. thanks to Santosh for uh, giving us this feast yes. on high focus online thank you all thank you thank, thank you all see you see you coming wednesday